This video is all about cell membranes, which is on chapter 7 of Campbell Biology. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we talk AP Bio content. Today, we're tackling the bulk of what Unit 2 is all about, which is mostly on cell membranes. And while this video has been developed around the AP Bio curriculum, this should be pretty useful for all high school level biology courses, so stick around. And you know, click that like and subscribe and all of that YouTube stuff. We study cell membranes in biology because of several reasons. At the most fundamental level, we study membranes as a common feature of all living things, ranging from the smallest prokaryotic bacteria to complex eukaryotic organisms like ourselves. After all, the membrane separates the individual from its external environment. We also learn about membranes as a means to set up some more difficult concepts that we learn about in the next unit regarding photosynthesis and cell respiration. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves quite yet. Instead, let's set up an outline of how we'll approach this chapter today. First, we'll talk about the structure of phospholipids that compose the bulk of plasma membranes. Then, we'll talk about the idea of a membrane's ability to act as a semi-permeable membrane, which then will lead us to movement of substrates across that membrane. Lastly, we'll talk about the movement of water across right. the membrane. Let's begin by looking at what a cell membrane looks like. In order to do that, we need to review phospholipids. We've all seen this image of a phospholipid bilayer before. As you may recall, phospholipids are amphipathic, meaning that they have a charged phosphate head that is hydrophilic, while their hydrocarbon tails are hydrophobic. A bunch of phospholipids in water naturally orient themselves in such a way that forms a bilayer with the lipids facing each other and the heads facing either sides of these aqueous environments. But a phospholipid bilayer on its own is not a cell membrane. In an actual membrane of an organism, we see a ton of other molecules that are associated with the said membrane. And in this image, you can see the phospholipid bilayer, but you also see many proteins here too, like integral proteins which are embedded into the membrane, or peripheral proteins which are simply associated with one side of that membrane. Now we also see glycoproteins, which are proteins with sugar groups coming out of them, glycolipids, cholesterol, and more. This is why we commonly use the fluid mosaic model in describing our plasma membranes. The mosaic idea is essentially what we've been discussing so far, how the membrane is not a homogeneous thing, but rather a heterogeneous thing. The fluid idea is important too, so let's talk about that for a moment. The fluidity can be thought of in two different ways. The first is how proteins on the membrane can seemingly float and drift about the membrane. This was first seen with mice and human cells that had their membrane proteins differentially tagged with fluorescent tags, which after merging of the cells seemed to mix. This indicated that these proteins were relatively free in moving around the surface of the cell. The second is how the membrane itself can become viscous or fluid with some optimal fluidity being regulated by the cells. This is important for all cells because if the membrane is too viscous, say for example a red blood cell traveling through the capillaries, they'd have a tough time bending and fitting through the small vessels. And if they're too fluid, well your membrane might become too leaky and that's not a good thing either. So this optimal fluidity then is important and as such can be regulated by two mechanisms. The first is by having phospholipids that contain either greater levels of saturation in their fatty acid chains or greater levels of unsaturated fatty acids. As you can imagine, saturated fatty acids would make for phospholipids that can be packed together a little bit more tightly and this would lead to greater viscosity. While phospholipids with higher proportions of unsaturated fatty acids would be less viscous and more fluid. So by controlling the types of phospholipids on the membranes themselves, cells can respond to external changes like temperature. Now there is yet one more way that fluidity can be controlled. In animal cells, just keep in mind that these cholesterol molecules can help the cells retain moderate fluidity without becoming too rigid or too soft. Now there's also this extra bit on different types of proteins that are embedded into the membrane, but the only one that we're gonna be focusing on for the purpose of this unit is just the transport proteins, which we'll discuss much more in just a few moments. First things first, we need to think about the cell membrane with its phospholipids as a barrier that allows cells to determine what can come in and what can go out. And when it comes to talking about this semi-permeability, it's actually more important to understand the impermeability that phospholipids can establish first. 
When we take a look at a phospholipid bilayer, we can make a couple of assumptions. One is that the environment to one side or the other of the bilayer would be aqueous. We know this because the phosphate heads, which are charged and therefore hydrophilic, are facing both of these directions. Second is that the lipid tail portion of the bilayer is a nonpolar environment, that is to say, hydrophobic. Now with that in mind, we can ask ourselves, well, what type of substances would be dissolved in either size of the membrane? Well, the answer is hydrophilic substances. Whether it be charged ions like sodium or chloride ions, or a large protein that is polar like lysozyme, these polar or hydrophilic substances would be perfectly happy on either side of that membrane. But the thing is, they would not be happy in the lipid bilayer. So what's fascinating is that more than the physical presence of the membrane being a barrier, is actually the solubility and the insolubility of substances that inhibit most of the movements across that membrane. That is to say that because sodium ions are charged and are found on either side of that membrane, the lipid region inhibits it from going to the other side. This would naturally create impermeability to most substances on either side, with the exception of small nonpolar gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if the phospholipids can create this impermeability, what can cells do to allow movements of substrates that they want? That's where facilitated diffusion comes in, where protein channels or carrier proteins can allow specific substances to pass through in accordance to diffusion. But wait, what is diffusion? Well, let's take a short side step and talk about that for a moment. Traditionally, diffusion is defined as the movement of substrates from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. We say that substrates are moving down the concentration gradient. And for the most part, it's sensible. If you put some food dye into water, it will naturally diffuse until some equilibrium has been reached. What's important though, is that this is a process that occurs in accordance with the way our universe naturally wants to behave. And as such, it does not require any energy to occur. Now, even if we were to put a semi-permeable membrane as is seen in this image, the orange molecule will still move to where there is lower concentration of it. And even if I add two substrates, each substrate will move in accordance to its own concentration gradient. This you want to keep in mind. Substrates diffuse in accordance to their own identities and not the totality of concentration, at the least in diffusion. So back to our discussion of facilitated diffusion. First, let's make it clear that facilitated diffusion is a process that falls under the heading of passive transport. The term passive here stems from the fact that the direction of movement is from high to low, and as a result does not require any energy to do. So with facilitated diffusion, all that's happening here is that the cells are allowing specific substances to move across the membrane through the use of channels and carrier proteins now again, down the concentration gradient. In this image, you can see a protein channel. It is really just a tunnel through which hydrophilic materials can cross that lipid barrier. There are a couple of important things to keep in mind though. First, keep in mind that channels tend to be substrate specific, as in a sodium channel will allow sodium ions to go through, but not chloride ions. Second, these channels are simply allowing diffusion to move things from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. Carrier proteins as seen here generally do the same thing, except instead of allowing the passage of substances, it physically relocates them from one side of the membrane to the other. Again, the high to low concentration is still in effect here without requiring energy. So, so far we've talked about how substances move from an area of high to low concentration, but sometimes cells might want to move things against their concentration gradient. For instance, if a cell has a ton of sugars in its cytoplasm, but still wants that one sugar sitting outside, it would need to move it from an area of low concentration to an area of higher concentration. Here we see cells employing something called active transport, where the term active means that the process requires energy precisely because the movement is going against the grain of the universe. What you need to know here is that active transport proteins look very much like channel proteins, but are referred to as pumps. In this image, you see a great example. It's a proton pump, which moves protons or H plus ions from inside of the cell to the outside, clearly showing their movement from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. The energy is represented by the usage of ATP, which as we'll learn in subsequent units, is a currency of energy within biological systems. 
But I want you to keep something in mind here though. There's this thing called the conservation of energy where energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So if the energy of the ATP molecule was used to pump protons out of the cell, well, where is that energy now? Well, it turns out that the energy is now stored in this potential for the protons to fall back into the cell. It's sort of like blowing air into a balloon and holding it shut, where if you allowed air to flow back out, that store pressure would be released with force. Utilizing this then, cells can do something like this. Here we see that the protons pumped out by the pump begins to fall back into the cell. And as they do, the previously held potential energy is released, thereby providing sufficient energy for sucrose to move against its own concentration gradient toward the inside of the cell. This is known as a co-transport system, and we see it quite a bit in biology, especially in prokaryotic organisms. Okay, now that we've talked about movement of things in and out of the cell, what about water? Can water move across the membrane? If so, which direction does it go? Well, it turns out that the answers to these questions are quite complicated. So let's take it step by step. First, we need to understand that while it is true that water is polar and it shouldn't be able to move across the membrane, water always gets a free pass through a special channel protein that we call aquaporins. It literally means water hole, and it allows water free passage across the membrane. So that's at least one of the questions answered. But does water go in, or does it come out? Now, in order to address that question, we need to first understand something called osmosis. You got the chromosomes in all the right places. You see, osmosis is the movement of water from an area of lower solid concentration to an area of higher solid concentration. This seems completely opposite to diffusion, and you're right. But there is a major distinction that we need to make here. So while diffusion was the movement of stuff in accordance to its own concentration gradient, osmosis moves water in accordance to the totality of all solutes on one side or the other. This means that if you have a bunch of sugars on one side and salts on the other, or any mixture of both on either side, water will simply move from where there are fewer solutes to where there are more solutes without discriminating or preferring what type of solutes are dissolved in either sides of the system. As this image shows, water moves from one side of the U-tube to the other side through the semi-permeable membrane to dilute the saltier system, ultimately attempting to equalize their concentrations. So putting everything together, we know that water moves freely between the environment and the cell. We also know that water will move from where there are fewer solutes in total to where there is more. This means that cells would have to be actually pretty careful not to lose too much water or gain too much water. Let's take a look at how this might play out. In this diagram, we see those scenarios. In a hypotonic solution, where the environment has less solutes because hypo means less, water would move into the cell trying to dilute it, potentially causing lysis, in animals at least. On the other hand, in a hypertonic solution, you have a situation in which the surrounding environment has more solutes, which would result in water moving out of the cell, causing shriveling. Isotonic? Well, everything is pretty good here. The rate of water moving in and out would be roughly the same. Now, the only difference for plants is that due to their cell wall, plants in hypotonic solutions would be pretty content. Water would come in, but would stop eventually once the cell wall exerts enough pressure to disallow further influx of water. In hypertonic solutions, though, the same shriveling would occur, albeit inside the cell wall, a situation that we call plasmolysis. This is the first step in making kimchi, salting the crap out of cabbage. So with that in mind, it seems that organisms need to sometimes deal with situations that are less than ideal. Let's take a look at one of these examples. The paramecium is a freshwater, single-celled protist. When we say fresh water, though, we mean that the surrounding environment is hypotonic. This would mean that water would always be rushing into the cell of the paramecium. In order to deal with this, paramecia have evolved specific adaptations called contractile vacuoles. It's essentially a vacuole that fills with water, which, at that point, is pumped out to the surrounding using energy. And it does this its entire life. I run and I run and I run and I run and I get out and I've gone nowhere. Nowhere! And this, of course, is an example of osmoregulation. All right, so while there is a bit more content on endocytosis and exocytosis, they're relatively simple concepts, so I'll leave those up to you guys. So that's going to do it for today. If you haven't done so already, be sure to ask yourself... What's after?
Yeah. yeah, that's subscribing and hitting that bell icon too. This has been Mikey with AVO Prep Academy, brought to you by AVO Media. See you next time.